Thank you for joining today's office hours. Today, we are honored to have Professor Jeremy Siegel, Senior Economist to Wisdom Tree, as well as Jeremy Schwartz, our Global Chief Investment Officer, and Kevin Flanagan, Head of Fixed Income Strategy, to discuss their views on the FOMC meeting. We like to keep office hours interactive, so please make sure to add your questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And with that, Jer, the floor is yours. Well, thank you all for joining. The professor is coming back from a cruise across the Mediterranean, but coming back with some really interesting takes. Uh, and uh, we've got the Fed meeting, but also the professor's been is uh, some of his tune. We'll hear, we'll hear an update from that. We again, as Kat said, we love to get your questions, so please use the Q and A. Kevin and I will ask some questions after the professor makes some comments. We also like to get what's on your mind. We have some survey questions here, uh, sort of two simple questions. First, about when will the first rate cut happen, uh, just to see when you think things will turn around. And second is how high will the terminal rate be? Um, you know, we didn't give a range here, but you can give some sense of where you think this sort of lower bound of the Fed funds target will be. Do you think there's gonna be one more hike, two more hikes? We should have put a no more hikes scenario, um, but you know the, the, the greater than six percent is also an option here as well. Professor, we'll give you the floor. Give us your latest thoughts on the Fed and and uh, your assessment of the economy. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, well, sorry we couldn't make fourteen in a row for the Dow for a hundred and thirty year record. Um, it looked that way at one o'clock, but uh, higher rates. Uh, squash the market. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about, how we're higher rates. Uh, uh, by the way, I thought this was uh, one of the best, if not the best news conference that uh, Jay Powell ran at the Fed. Um, and there's two reasons for this. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, several reasons for that. First of all, he's become very um, stressing data dependence, um, not any really preconceived notion, one, two, three more, more, I think we need to commit, you know, repeating what the committee says, really, you know, he just talked about how many data points there are gonna be. This is the way the Fed should be. This is a very good. Secondly, um, he, his, his discussion was much more that there are balanced risks. It's not just upside inflation. Um, but there could be downside real economic activity because of the decline uh, in, in the labor market that we've seen. Now, again, I'm going to talk about that in a moment because the economy has been extremely strong. But uh, he seemed to acknowledge that much more. Uh, I'm sure there, there were several members of the FOMC um, that uh, were not really in favor of the increase in rate. They went along. There were no dissents. But uh, talked about what they saw as softening in the economy and the dangers of rising rates. He talked about uh, the, the the latent effects of policy much more uh, than before. He also kind of put pushed back on wages causing inflation. He had done that in the past, but he talked more about that. He also talked about we don't have to get inflation down to two percent before we start lowering. In fact, he he said that, you know that would be wrong because then we'd have way too much uh, momentum on the downside if we did not start lowering rates by the time that uh, you know inflation hit our target. In many, many ways, um, um, it, it was, it was uh, far more balanced. Um, over the last two weeks, um, two, three weeks actually, um, and it reflected in last week's commentary uh, that we send out and uh, actually comments I had made earlier, I have been looking at the data, the forward-looking data, very closely. Um, in particular, the money supply, M2, uh, which stopped falling and has now begun rising again, although at a moderate pace. Commodity prices, which also have stopped falling and started rising, and home prices on the case shower Index, which had uh, fallen uh, pretty sharply from the high that was reached in, in June of last year, uh, also has been rising. Uh, a comparable federal home indexes have also been rising. When I see forward-looking indexes rise, um, that means to me that the economy can withstand higher rates than I had thought. <laughs> 
the, the economy uh, could withstand. In fact, I think almost everyone, in some extent, including the Fed, uh, which, uh, as you know, forecast for this year, less than 1% GDP growth last December. And of course, we just came in at a 2.4 for the second quarter after a 2.0 for the first. So, uh, you know, the only way we're going to get a 0.9 is a real deep recession in third and fourth quarter. That does not look in the cards. So, uh, you know, again, growth is surprised on the upside, including the Fed, uh, for everybody. I mean, there may be one or two strikers out there. Uh, on that. Well, what does that mean practically? It means that where I had thought that the bite of these higher rates would take effect uh, in the third quarter pretty substantially, I'm not at all convinced that's going to happen. Um, and as a result, where I had thought the rate would be falling Fed funds by the end of the year, I don't think that that's going to happen. Now, whether there is going to be another one increase or or not, I'm I'm not going to argue that point right now. But um, uh, maybe higher for longer, if you want to use that terminology, um, in terms of the rates. Also, the terminal rates that the Fed funds and the bond rate uh, will get to has I have raised that. Um, I had thought that we would get tips down to zero, ten year. Um, I now think it's perhaps closer to 1%, maybe one and a quarter. I thought we'd get Fed funds once we reach the 2% target down to 2%, one and a half to 2%. I now think it's going to be two and a half to 3%. So there'll be a mild uh, upward slope of, of, uh, of the term structure, but at a higher rate uh, than before. Um, uh, now, why is that? Because the economy... For, for various reasons, um, has not, has raised the rate at which um, uh, it, uh, the economy is slowing. And I think there's, there's two reasons why these real rates are going to be higher. One is certainly real growth, but again, not just past real growth, which has been, again, much faster than people thought, but future real growth. Maybe it's the excitement of AI. Maybe it's the fact that uh, you know the economy has not slowed. Um, again, today we had uh, a uh, initial jobless claims that fell again. Remember that number was going up in May and really um, stoked my fears that that was the beginning of a substantial slowdown. Well, in, in June and late July, it, it disappeared and is now going down to the numbers we had earlier in the year. This is not an uncontrolled boom. This is not an overly tight labor force, at least not yet, and I don't think so. But certainly it is not the progressive weakening uh, that we uh, saw uh, before. What does that do in terms of stocks? Well, the probability of a recession is down. I was on CNBC three weeks ago when I was still worried about over tightening on the Fed, and I said 50-50 chance of a recession. I would now say it's probably 25% a chance of a recession, not out of the question. Uh, but one of the reasons why I think uh, it is less likely is not just the inherent strength of the economy, the ability to continue chugging along at real rates that are substantially higher than they've been for um, uh, for years and uh, before. But I think that the Fed is more in line uh, with what the true reality is. In other words, seeing two-sided risk. But what does that mean? I think they are in a position now to react to any weakness faster than they would have been earlier this year. In other words, by, by seeing the two-sided risk, if we really do see weakness in uh, the labor front, there's gonna be a bigger clamor to, hey, not only stop raising rates, but actually lower raising rates. Um, don't forget, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the retirement of uh, James Bullard, the super hawk from the St. Louis Fed. Um, we have two pretty dovish members as voting members for this year, 2023, on the FOMC that have made their voices, I think, felt in terms of the two-sided risks that they see. So if the Fed is, in fact, more likely now to be less dogmatic about the inflation, seeing the progress, that means they are more likely to lower rates 
if we see the weakness. That's good for stocks and that's good for the economy. It's also good for value stocks if we want to drill down a, a bit. Clearly, value stocks are the cyclical stocks uh, by and large. Uh, by saying that um, there's a lower probability recession, that automatically uh, puts them in a better light. And particularly with the valuations that we see on them, and, and, and Jerry, uh, Jeremy and, and Kevin could talk about the valuation of some of our funds that are, uh, that, that are value-based, um, they seem to me to be uh, particularly uh, uh, attractive. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say I was overly worried um, when I saw the money supply going down, when I saw housing prices going down, when I saw commodities collapsing uh, and the Fed being so dogmatic on continuing to raise rates to the end. Now, when I see those three indicators turn around, the strength of the economy remaining and the combination that Fed Chair Powell seems to be much more flexible, uh, all that has allayed my fears. Now, what, what uh, you know, I said that that's good for value stocks. Uh, all this does mean higher interest rates than I would have thought before. So, I mean, like what drove the market, despite strong economic activity and, uh, and all the rest, what drove market down at the end of the day is that on you know, the 10 year, was up uh, in yield considerably. The, the tips, which got down to 146 on the 10 year, I think is now in the upper 150s. In other words, it's gonna have to contend with a higher discount rate. Earnings are great, no question about that. Yes, we've had some misses, but the beats have been very, very good in terms of what we've seen this week. Um, uh, we've seen very little diminution in the forecast of earnings for 2024 normally, we see a, de a deterioration of about 50 cents a week in a year, a year forward forecast. We have not seen that um, so far, which shows actually a strength in terms of that. We have not, not much warnings uh, from the firms that have reported uh, that they see inherent weakness. Clearly, there are areas that are weak, but uh, clearly we are seeing a much stronger economy. Good for earnings does mean higher rates that capitalize that earnings does mean less probability, in my opinion, of recession, um, means a more responsive Fed in case there is a downturn. None of this is guaranteed. And by the way, yes, um, we still have an inverted yield curve. Uh, 60 years, that has been the single most reliable indicator of recession. Um, however, you know, we have some very unusual circumstances with respect to COVID. I mean, it was the first pandemic in over 100 years, so maybe 60 years uh, of, of, uh, of good predictions from the term structure will, will also uh, not come uh, across. Um, not a guarantee by any means. And by the way, uh, let me remind you that we have had inversions at the tail end that are just about now 15 to 18 months later um, uh, that we begin to see the downturn and we could, we could, you know, listen, fall could come around, people could get their credit card bills, take a look at the interest rates they're paying and say, whoa, I'm going to have to cut back. That's possible. Certainly that's possible. Um, but I think the Fed would be more responsive now than its attitude earlier this year. Also, what I brought up a number of times, we are entering, we are in <laughs> uh, political season. Um, uh, you know, the Democrats know that the worst thing that could happen to them is a recession in 2024. Um, uh, there will be a lot of political pressure on the Fed to lower rates if there is weakness in the labor market. And by the way, not, not incorrect given that the Fed does remember have a dual mandate to uh, unemployment and inflation. Um, you know, I've said for a long time, ringing out one more percent of inflation, particularly by attacking wages, which I think is, is definitely wrong. And by the way, again, Powell backed away. We're not really, you know, targeting wages. We kind of look at them uh, as some indication, but it was not a direct target. Uh, clearly there's pressure since the wage earner has fallen behind inflation for him and her to catch up. And there's gonna be more and more political pressure on that front as our elections approach. So he has to be sensitive on that particular point. 
They should be sensitive on that particular point. Um, the battle against inflation is one. I said it was one a year ago, basically. And in fact, if you use proper indicators, we know as our uh, as, as we we at Wisdom Tree have computed that inflation has in fact leveled out if you take a count proper housing uh, indicators uh, going forward. Again, you'd have to look at those commodity prices. Oil is inching up, commodities are inching up. Housing is beginning to inch up, although most of those very thin markets, many of those deals are cash deals. People don't want to give up their mortgage rate uh, of you know two, three percent. So as a result, we don't have a real thick market there to, to judge it, but there definitely is a turnaround in that sentiment there. Um, is it possible that if commodity prices continue to rise? By the way, I should also mention the falling dollar, which by the way is very good for earnings, certainly for the multinationals. Um, uh, uh, going forward, and it has been a source, no more foreign exchange headwinds as there was so severely earlier this year and late last year um, um, uh, that we had. Um, but uh, uh, I, is it possible that we see this upturn in commodity prices and home prices begin to ignite inflation again? I doubt it, but not impossible. Now, if in fact that means that we need even higher rates, Again, I would consider that to be, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I, I, I don't think that's in the mindset. Um, this is really a bounce off the bottom, but there is firmness in M2 commodity prices and housing prices. In fact, I think uh, uh, Jeffrey Gunlock uh, in an interview on CNBC that immediately followed the FOMC meeting said, uh, since the last meeting, the best uh, investment has actually been uh, the, the Bloomberg commodity index up 8%. Uh, since that time. Again, after being down 20, 25% before. So somewhat of a bounce, but there's also uh, higher lows and higher highs. It's more than just a dead cat bounce off the bottom. That's a, that's something that you want to actually look at. Again, I'm not giving any warnings on inflation. I'm just saying I see a turnaround from deflation. And given the level of real interest rates have been elevated, it means that at this particular point, you know, I certainly don't see the Fed easing without some really deterioration in those real indicators. Again, nothing is impossible, um, but uh, certainly given the data that we've seen in the last few weeks, unlikely. So, Great. my former account, uh, should we look at the poll here and see the results? Sure, we've given people a good amount of time. That'd be great if we could see the poll results. Yeah, and later in 2024, some probably some people say 2025. <laughs> and uh, how high will the terminal fund be? 575. All right, so, uh, you know, uh, 550 is, I guess, one more hike, right? Um, is it 550? I mean, it's in a range for five and a quarter to five and... Um, a half, so five and a half to five and three quarters. The Fed funds market, by the way, again, remember Fed funds is an underestimate of the true expectation because of the edging ability of Fed funds against shocks to risk assets. So you have to add maybe an eighth of up 10 basis, 10, 15 basis points. So let's say the January Fed funds rate, I'm not looking it up right now, you can, I would say to actually get an unbiased estimate of what actually it is. And it, it's probably one more hike in that range, but it will be dictated by the data um, and um, not uh, it is not set by the Fed at this particular juncture. And there's a lot of data obviously become, coming out between now and that September meeting. Professor, there was a question that came in and, and I, I thought this was interesting. And I, I wonder if, I wouldn't say we marginalized it, but it didn't seem to get much attention in terms of economic impact. And it was a mismatch between fiscal and monetary policy. Now, I mean, and that was, could you comment on that? So, you know, I mean, we did have the infrastructure bill get passed. So are we marginalizing the impact that that fiscal package could be having as it begins to work its way through the economy? Well, my understanding is that that's a multi-year package. In contrast to the shots, uh, the excessive shots that were given in the COVID crisis of, you know, two trillion, three trillion immediately or within three or six months. This is multi-year. 
And I think the first year, and I might be wrong on this somewhat, is something like 500 billion, 400 billion. That's a stimulus, but not an outsized stimulus. It's not like you were really pushing all the, the levers plus on fiscal while pulling all the levers back on money. Um, I, I would say the fiscal stance is pretty neutral, actually, net. Um, it might be slightly stimulative, but nothing like what we had in 2020 and 2021. So I don't know if we're really having a, a what I would call a dramatic mismatch right now between overly stimulative fiscal and very restrictive monetary. There was a question coming back to one of your indicators you mentioned has stabilized, um, but also was at the core of your inflation thesis. Somebody asked to explain the money supply correlation to inflation in general, and maybe you can talk about it you know, recently too. Yeah. So um, uh, of course, this goes you know, back to Milton Friedman and the, the, the monetary research he did that garnered the Nobel Prize. There's no very close one-to-one year-to-year relationship. Usually inflation lags by a couple of years, uh, 18 to 24 months off the M2 money supply. Again, this is M2. And let's be very, very careful. This is not the Fed's balance sheet. The only part of the Fed's balance sheet that is in M2 is currency. None of these excess reserves are in M2. So, you know, again, the Fed is reducing its balance sheet. M2 could still be going up as long as bank deposits are going up. Um, uh, and we have seen some reflow on bank deposits, and that's because if loan demand goes up, the economy is chugging along, banks give out loans, that increases the uh, money supply, increasing liquidity uh, in, in, in the economy. Now, what we saw, and I lectured on, was the, the, the largest single yearly increase in history in 2020 um, uh, in the money supply. Uh, and then, you know, for two years, we had very high increases in M2 money supply, and then suddenly, we had the biggest increase decrease in 85 years, actually uh, uh, the first negative growth of the money supply uh, in 2022. Um, the money supply continued to go down in the first few months of 2023, but has turned up in the last two months. Um, it has turned up for the first time uh, since the squeeze of the Fed started. That's what's encouraging me. Now, it, it's it's more that it isn't going down anymore that I fear too tight. It, that's what it should be. I, I wanted it actually, the Fed to slow down from a 10% rate down to a 4 or 5% rate rather than go negative and now increase it at a 4 and 5% rate. I thought that that shock was, was too great. Nonetheless, in the last two months, we've had about a 4% annualized rate. It's too short a time to, to call it a trend. Um, and by the way, if there's a lot of weakness in the economy, you, you will see M2 money supply go down because banks won't be extending those loans. But but there is a lag. Um, it, it is not uh, it is not contemporaneous. So uh, but the but the money supply stopped going down. That means that deflationary forces still might come from earlier. But don't forget, we had 40 percent increase in money now, a 5 percent decrease and now a stability. So we've never had swings like that ever. So in, in a way, um, uh, a uh, stepping on the brake of an extreme proportion, but now letting the pedal off the brake, uh, which uh, is giving, I think, alleviation of bringing the dollar down, bringing uh, uh, commodity prices stop going down, and also you know helping on uh, that housing uh, front uh, in terms of, of uh, the pricing of, of housing. We've got a couple of questions that were QT related, the balance sheet related. And since you just uh, mentioned it, I thought it would be good to throw it in. One of them had something to do with the fact that it, it could be playing a, a, I guess, significant role in the inversion of the curve. And the other was, you know, the, the question is, when do you think the Fed will begin to reduce its balance sheet? Well, they are already reducing their balance sheet. But, you know, I think the question is more, when do you think possibly they could begin outright sales, say, of mortgage-backed securities or something along those lines? So what are your thoughts? Well, I on think they are selling the mortgage-backs. I think their goal, 
you know, I think what is 100, uh, 100 billion dollars a, a month. Um, and I think it is mostly mortgage backs. They want to get rid of their mortgage backs. They want to go into the pure, a pure treasury basis, which they were in, you know, continuously, uh, you know, for 95 years until the financial crisis. I think they want to get rid of all their mortgage backs. That might be putting some pressure, by the way, on mortgage rates. Um, and one reason why they might be a little bit higher, they're usually two points above the 10 year, now they're three. Part of the reason is inversion of the curve. Uh, sh higher short rates will give you a higher spread also. Um, but some might be that they're getting rid of their mortgage backed securities. They're getting rid of their treasuries, but at a slower rate. Um, th but that does add to supply in the marketplace. And by the way, the Fed deficit, um, excuse me, the fiscal deficit, which I think is still about a trillion, trillion and a half dollars a year, now far less than COVID, which was three or four, but uh, still much, uh, still a deficit is adding another trillion, uh, trillion and a half to the supply of treasuries. Of course, a growing economy and inflation reduces those real values um, of, of treasury. A 5% inflation on a $30 trillion debt is a one and a half trillion dollar reduction in real value. So you, you have to have a one and a half trillion dollar deficit just to replace the real value of debt that's reduced through a 5%, let's say, inflation rate over a one-year period just to get you on par. And then you have economic growth that would actually cause for even greater demand for treasuries um, on top of that as a proportion of all other assets. So there's plenty of sources of demand, shrinking real supply because of inflation, increasing nominal supply because of the deficit, but not a huge deficit, not an outlandish deficit, and some increase in supply through the quantitative tightening. But uh, you know the the the, the uh, you know I, I think uh, Gunlock mentioned and it was true yesterday um, um, uh, that uh, the the ten year was exactly the same as it ended on December thirty first. Today it's probably a little higher, but throughout all what's going on, really there's been very little movement in in the ten year bond over uh, the last uh, six uh, to eight months. Maybe this is a question for both of you to comment on, um, Kevin and Professor. There have been a few questions about what levels of yields become interesting for long bonds. Um, you know, we talked about the inverted yield curve. You, you, Professor, you gave your number on the real rate, so you could tie that to a nominal bond expectation. Maybe you know, we, we've last high of this current cycle, I think, it was four twenty-five. We we got back down. Now we're at four again. Where do you think bonds become attractive long run to each of you? Um, and Kevin, how do you think about that on fixed income portfolios? Well, you know, I mean, we've been we've been proponents of we'd rather be late than early to the duration party. And Professor, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I love to say if you were Rip Van Winkle and you fell asleep and you saw where the 10 year yield was then to where it is now, you'd wonder, well, what's the big deal? But in the meantime, we've gone, Jared, to your point, four and a quarter to 330 to 380 to 330, back to 4%. So there has been a, a lot of volatility. And that's why we continue to, you know, talk about floating rate treasury notes, our, our USFR, where you're you're getting five, 45 and a half percent without that kind of volatility in the market. And you don't have to essentially put your chip on the table into duration saying that, you know, hey, I, I think the 10 year, this is at 4%, I think we're going to 3%. Because that was one of the questions here, uh, I think that you were alluding to, Jerry, you know, is this a good time? Are bonds cheap at this stage of the game? And, you know, what I, I was actually looking at this to write a blog. It seems every time we've gotten to that point over the last, say, eight, nine, ten months, we get to 4%, we get a rally, but it's very short-lived. Uh, it's a visible rally. It, it could be 40, 50 basis points. But then it snaps right back up again. And I don't think that's what you want to see in the bond part of your portfolio. Yeah, I mean, actually, um, you know, now I, you know, I, I had originally thought that we would see the long bond at three by the end of the year because I thought we'd see more weakness in 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 the real uh, in the real economy. Uh, I don't see that as much anymore. And in fact, if you if you would ask me, given the strength of what data we have seen recently. Um, uh, I would say that I would more likely think the long bond is going up in yield now than down, and we may penetrate four on the upside. And maybe what was that? Uh, the twelve-month high, Kevin? Was it four and a quarter? 
Yeah, I mean, intraday it was 433, but it closed at a four and a quarter. So, I right. mean, here we are again at 401 as we're talking. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that now. People say, oh, my God, you know, what does that mean? Well, in a strong economy with strong earnings, it wouldn't affect stocks all that much. It's not going to be good for the bondholders. Again, it's going to be great for those people rolling short, such as USFR does, if you want to avoid that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what I thought we we're going to see a lot of weakness and bring that that long bond down to three. I don't see that anymore as the most uh, likely uh, scenario or as easily a likely scenario. Again, no, no scenario is impossible, as we all know. Uh, you know, all of a sudden another strain of the pandemic could come and you'll you'll see the long bond at two again. Um, but uh, uh, it seems to be far unlikely given the strength that we've seen at these real rates um and the forward looking pricing indicators which are the most sensitive the dollar which is really sensitive um i think that the, i think the bias is higher yields that's going to be a challenge to stock if the yields would stay <laughs> you know in the uh, let's say 360 370 i would say the stock market could have another five or ten percent yields going up to four and a quarter could could the bubble you know could put a, a, a cap on how enthusiastic people are going to get about equities, given that earnings are not uh, beating by good margins and, and forecasts uh, are getting rosier and recession scenarios are getting less likely. And all that together is, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, would cause stocks to, to be choppy on uh, maybe with an upward tilt depending on how high you go, but certainly restrain. Um, you know, I'd rather be a stockholder in a bond order almost all the time, and I'd rather be one now. Um, uh, I think, I, I really think with the strength that I'm seeing right now, we could see a steepening. And by the way, a steepening of the curve, you know, um, stronger growth, uh, you know, we'll, 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 that, that's, that's good. In a way, we want this. We want to bring a normal curve back because that's a non-recession signal. <laughs> I don't think we're going to get the long bond to five and a half, which would restore normality. Um, uh, but uh, you know, we have uh, if we if we can get that long bond up in yield uh, and lower that inversion, um, uh, that's positive for the economy and 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 positive. Uh, for uh, um, risk assets. So, Chair and the Reaper. Professor, let me volley one back to you guys. Um, regional banks question came in. We, it, it, it almost seems as if we don't even talk about regional banks a anymore, right, as to compare where we were a couple of months ago. So just wanted to get your thoughts on that. And I know, Jerry, you've been talking about the bank run, the bank walk, um, things along those lines. And you continue to see, Professor, in their policy statement, talking about the potential for tightening in credit conditions from the regional bank fallout. So I wanted to get both of your gents' opinion uh, on the regional banks and, and in terms of equities as well. You know, what does that mean in that area of the market? Well, I think you're going to get more consolidation. You know, I, I think a lot of re regional banks are, are going to be rolled into some of the bigger banks, very honestly. I don't think there's going to be deposit runs. I don't think we're going to have a banking crisis. Or anything like that, but the truth of it is, uh, you know, the, and the truth of it is, even though people are talking about stabilization of commercial real estate, um, um, many of the regional banks, if they have floating rate loans on that, what they have to charge, you know, SOFR plus two points, so they're rolling at seven and a half. These these older buildings can't afford seven and a half. The owners are basically, you know, going to give the keys to the banks. Say hey, you you, you got it. Uh, the banks don't want it, so they'll make <laughs> they'll probably make deals to keep it lower. And as long as their depositors don't run away, <laughs> as they should to our USFR, right? <laughs> um, uh, That's uh, the tricky issue. You know, they they could probably limp along for a while if the depositors say, "Hey, I can get five and a half on Treasuries, uh, short term with zero capital risk. I'm not staying in these bank accounts." Then the only way is to is actually to merge these in to larger banks. Um, I, I I think we're going to get that again without a banking crisis or anything like that. We're just going to get a lot of mergers of of these smaller banks 
that are heavier in the commercial office real estate. And I, I should specify the office because commercial real estate outside of office is doing quite well. So, uh, uh, but uh, the offices and the extent that they have it, um, they're going to be strained. I, yeah, I've been conflicted in the sense of the professor's call on the cyclical rotation is very good for small caps, very good for value. What you find in small value is you find a lot of the banks. And, and so, you know, I've, al I've also said that I also agree, agree exactly with the professor saying the pressure on depositors could come from more options that make it easier to spend off treasuries, which we, we obviously believe in at Wisdom Tree, there's be more options to do that. Um, we're working on those options in our prime app, you know, so I, I think the the banks still aren't paying the 5%. You know, you saw the PacWest news this week, and then the regional banks rallied on it. But like the, the headline today was PacWest interest costs soared 23 times in six months, you know, and so these banks are still not paying the appropriate rates, which is still a challenge, you know, I think that's still- a Jeremy, that could be going from 20 basis points to 30 basis. That's a 50% rally in their interest cost. It was 23 times though. It was a big number. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll go. So it could be going from five basis points to one, maybe, who knows? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, they're gonna be challenged. I mean, let's, I, I, and, and this is something to consider. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of financial advisors you know, they don't, they, they don't know where the market's going. They don't want people, people say, I want something safe. They say, all right, how much do you have in your bank account? What are you getting? Now I can get you into five and a half percent treasuries and CDs and well, and, and things like that. Let's look over that. I mean, that's a win-win for them. That could cause a drain and, you know, it could be triggered just by, a, you know, it, it's like the you know, straw breaks the camel's back. It's, the Fed keeps on going up a quarter point. More people say, all right, that's enough. You know, I'm not getting that, you know, 0% on my accounts and they're going to do a lot more active money management, loss of deposit funds um, for those that are there. Now, again, uh, to the fact, to, if, if they don't have, uh, if they have good assets, they just raise their sofa and they're going to collect more, you know, um, uh, on, on that score. Uh, but to the extent that they're locked in or have a commercial office space, you know, that that will be challenging. Again, you're, you're right. I mean, the PAC West, actually, I, I looked at the graph of PAC West, right? PAC West, of course, as all regional banks did, shot downward on the SVB news last March. The price that it reached, I think within a day or two there, now it went lower, um, but the price that finally got <laughs> settled at, it was exactly the price that it hit on the day that SVB or two days after SVB went under. So it's like the really a lot of investors had it right on those regional banks. Um, there was an article in Bloomberg about uh, Barry, you know, the great the short seller that made money in the financial crisis, making a killing on the commercial banks and back west. But actually you read it and you made about 10, five cents or 10 cents a, a share. He didn't really make a big killing. Uh, really, at, uh, they brought it down and that's uh, seemingly what it was worth. Um, so, uh, they're, you know, um, you're getting a good dividend yield at time. Listen, if you can hold steady with a great dividend yield, you don't need a, the stock to go up. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see how that, that plays out. You know, this is a U.S. baseball, right? But there's a question that came in about, some of the divergent growth outlooks and rate policies between the U.S. and the rest of the world. Jar, I wanted to throw this one to you, especially you know looking at it from Japan. We've gotten actually quite a few inquiries on Japan of late. I was wondering if you could you could throw some comments out on that. Yeah, and there's some you know, some talk today that some of the move in interest rates was the speculation that they go away from their yield curve control, or at least there's some some hypotheticals that they start talking about it tonight at their policy meeting that you get further support on higher rates. And they're one of the few central banks who still hasn't done much to, to move things away. Japan, to me, is still one of the interesting value stories in the world. We're at 20 times PEs for the U.S., 20 times forward PEs, you know, with the tech stocks at 30 and, and the non-tech at 17. Our dividend weighted Japan is at 12 times earnings. So it's a, it's a healthy, healthy discount. They've got much higher yields. The, the dividend weighted Japan is basically on par with dividends, almost as US high dividend stock. I mean, they were known as such a low dividend country for so long, but now real 
representative of, of small cap value, but with sort of more larger cap, more cash rich companies. So I'd actually say for people who look at small cap value in the US, you get the same exact yields in Japan, dim weighted. And if you like, you know, if you follow Buffett with his 5% extra sort of, he, he, you know, he did it on a currency hedge basis by issuing bonds, which is basically getting a 5% carry. You get that by hedging the currency too. People might say, hey, the end's going to go up if they move away from yield curve control, but you could get this 5% carry in the meantime without taking any currency risk. So I, I think that's still an interesting idea. Uh, I think going away from China in the regional diversification is sort of an interesting play for Japan. Um, and you know, there's a lot of speculation on China. Are they going to up their stimulus? I'm getting a little bit of lukewarm feeling on that from our China contacts and we have Li Chen, who's our, who's from China. She's actually traveling China for a month. Some of the local news I'm getting from her, just talked to her today, is not. Is, is you see a lot of travel, you see a lot of busyness, but don't expect major stimulus measures. She doesn't think the government really is in the position to do all that. So, anyways, there are a few comments on on Asia and Japan. Do you, uh, Jeremy, would you recommend uh, uh, hedging uh, the yen or not? I mean, long run. I, well, I like the 5% carry short run, but I do say long run, why, I, I, I've been saying what Buffett did forever, saying why, you know, you think the stocks are cheap, why take this extra currency call? Uh, now, Japan was one where they were oppositely moving historically. They, the yen was an offset as sort of the risk on, risk off trade. It's lost some of that recently. It's not been as a diversifier as it was before, but I say just buy the stocks are cheap. Who cares about what happens? Yeah, I honestly think it's lost. It's lost a lot. It's just not as critical in the world economy. Um, and people have so many other ways to, uh, you know, to, to risk hedge. Uh, I mean, treasuries are great, you know, also risk off as long as it's not inflation that you're, you're hedging against. Uh, again, you know, any sort of banking crisis, you want to be in long treasuries, any pandemic war. I mean, I'm talking about the geopolitical bench. You want to be in treasuries. I mean, you, that, that will give you a very short-term good hedge if, if that's important to you. Uh, it's always it's a bad hedge against inflation, uh, obviously. And as that those risks going on, and by the way, it's another reason why I think yields might be gone gone higher. Is people saying, you know what, you know, I know, I, you know, I got I got whammed. It, it isn't as good a hedge as I thought. And, uh, you know, with that, they're just not as anxious to hold it. We had 40 years of basically no inflation where it served as a great risk hedge against bear markets. Um, financial crisis, even the, the, you know, the, the, the pandemic, uh, the emerging market crisis, the, the real estate crisis in 1990, commercial real estate. I mean, they, they were really good hedges. And then came the bear market caused by the inflation, the Fed tightening, and they were the worst hedges possible. And people are going to be saying, hey, that these are not all right. You know, they'll work sometimes and they'll work others. I'm not as enamored on them. I'm certainly not going to get, get down to 1%, 1.5%. Oh, well, 57 basis points is how far the 10-year went, <laughs> I think, in 21. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of people are saying, hey, uh, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna just looking for something else. Um, and that, by the way, will yield. That will that will lead to higher, longer-term yield. Uh, you know, as we've stressed, uh, you know that the 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 risk hedge asset ability of any asset, um, the beta, uh, the, the lower the beta, the be the lower the yield, and the better the asset um, is bid. And uh, if it's not viewed as a good hedge risk asset. Um, it's going to lose that beta and its yield is going to be higher. And, you know, a lot of people might think it's impaired. Uh, also, the fact that we mentioned higher growth going forward, if we're optimistic on a rebound in productivity, if we're optimistic on AI and its possibilities, uh, real GDP, et cetera, and so on, you know, um, that also will raise real yields um, uh, and, and not impair stocks because all those rebound to the the profits of the, of the stock market. Here's one on the macro side for you, Professor. Talking about the potential for dis, uh, consumer discretionary spending going to diminish once the extra money that was saved with COVID is gone. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Is, is consumer spending more resilient than we think? 
Well, that's a very good point. I mean, that's basically, see, price, you know, when, when there's a tremendous injection of money, as there was, 40% actually, total money between March of 2020 and March of 2022, uh, you know, that's going to, you know, lead to a burst of prices that's going to erode away that extra money. And a lot of that is being eroded away. And a lot of people are forecasting that, you know, that will mostly be eroded away by, you know, the fall or late fall, some say you were early spring, it depends on what base you actually use as far as uh, that's concerned, but employment is still strong. Um, the thing that, I mean, I, I could talk about the downside risks. I mean, I, I, I still think, you know, for, for a, a new, new homeowner that doesn't have equity in his home is buying a home today, 80% uh, uh, mortgage financed, uh, it, it, the cost is 150% more, 150% more than it was three years ago. And that's the biggest chunk out of uh, a, a, um, a, a individual's budget. Um, you know, where else, what are you going to spend? How are you, if you buy, if you're buying a new home on an 80% mortgage, you have very little discretionary uh, money for the average individual to spend on restaurants and trips and all the rest. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of those purchases yet, et cetera. Um, but, you know, if that begins to bite, all those credit cards, you know, everyone's having fun this summer, they're traveling, uh, they're eating out, uh, you know, those credit cards, you know, what? One, one reason why historically, you know, the biggest crashes in the market come in the month of September and October um, is basically, uh, you know, let's party over the summer and the bills come due in the fall tuition bills for parents. I mean, we could go on and on to talk about, whoa, uh, could that strike? And um, yes, it could. And the Fed has to be really alert if it sees that type of slowdown happening um, and saying, whoa, you know, I'm not gonna be dogmatic here. Um, uh, th that's a, I don't consider it to be strong because employment, is still so strong, whole, and you know, don't forget, two thirds of, of of Americans own their own home, so they have home equity that that has gone up tremendously. There's a lot of untapped home equity. I'm talking about the strains of the new homeowner. Um, of course, there's been a lot made of the fact that there is going to be a resumption of uh, the um, uh, student debt payments in October. It's going to drain about you know some amount away. From spending, I mean, you can you can talk about these negatives there. Um, uh, you know, could it be the straw that breaks the camel's back? Of course, uh, it's possible. Um, but um, uh, um, at this particular point, uh, the other strengths are are still very very apparent. I'm going to wrap in two questions that are semi related. Um, what you know, one one talked about. Or so there's another economist saying the S and P fair value is around 3,500, uh, and then they ask the question, how much do you think we could fall into a recession? Uh, but then you know another question is related that, that really I wanted you to comment on, but just using that as the backdrop for a preamble to the question was, you know, for 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 a moderate investor, um, people coming in with new money and they sort of ask, what's, or you can get five percent in floating rate treasuries. Or you, you know, you with all these things on the horizon. Do you? How do you think about allocating new new money to work today with five percent treasuries versus right. you know the recession okay. risk and all these other things? You get five percent nominal in treasuries. At a twenty PE, you get five percent real in stocks. At a seventeen PE, which I think you said was value, that's a six percent real real yield in stocks. If you want a real yield in treasuries, the 10-year tips, I believe, is 1.6%. So there's your premiums. You know, to value stocks, you're, you're getting a 4.5% annual premium in value stocks relative to 5% treasuries. Um, wow, that compounds an awful lot if you're putting long-term money away for 10, 20, 30 years. That's how I would look at it. Um, clearly for, you know, a real risk averse person, he's, he's, he or she's been collecting income 
I hope it's tax exempt. Don't forget treasuries are not tax exempt. They're only state local tax exempt. So unless you got them in a sheltered account, you're going to be paying, you know, uh, up to 30% taxes on those and, and maybe more. Uh, that reduces its yield. You can, of course, go into munis and avoid that federal tax, but that's at a lower rate yet. And again, not protected against inflation going forward. Very good. Um, yeah, people, there's a, 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 a daily dashboard. If you haven't checked out our strategies page, uh, right from the top of your links on your homepage, you go to strategies on the markets is a link from that strategies page. You can find our daily dashboard, daily market snapshot. It's got a 20 page report that I look first thing every morning. It has things like the tips yield curve across time. You can see where the latest is, how it's changed. It's got valuation. So you can check out the PEs on the tech, the non-tech part of the S&P, all of our different indexes, value indexes. And you know the, the non-tech S&P is what's at 17 times. You can go to high dividend stocks in the US at 12 times, large cap dividend stocks at 15 times. So there's definitely really interesting opportunities uh, away from the S&P uh, at, at 20 times. So I think there, you should definitely check out that. Well, 12, 12 PE ratio is an eight and a half percent earnings yield real. Uh, which is wow, it's a good um, number. That's high dividends U.S. I've been talking about that. Uh, DHS is our ETF for high dividend U.S. It's you know again the same number as Japan, which is also twelve PE. But you know the the large cap U.S. is a different basket uh, of stocks that I think is an interesting interesting opportunity today. I want to throw this one out. Uh, saw this question come in. What do you make of the lack of breath in the rise of the S and P five hundred? It's widened out. I mean, yeah, those magnificent seven being what seventy percent of the the increase or eighty whatever. It is remarkable. Um, I've commented on that before. Uh, that you know, basically, except for those real speculative the zooms, the docu signs, the pelotons, and all that, and some of the EV stocks, the same stocks that led the great rally, uh, you know, um, uh, post pandemic. Uh, are leading the post uh, bear market rally again. Very unusual that the same group would lead the rally, but um, they are global firms. Uh, most of them are coming in with earnings again that are good. And again, now uh, instead of headwinds of foreign exchange, they have tailwinds of foreign exchange with the dollar down. Um, and of course they had that uh, ability to not be as sensitive to the economy when recession fears were much higher. Uh, that's one reason why we've had a little broadening out uh, as the economy has stayed strong and some of those recession fears have, uh, have uh, diminished. I see we're getting closer and closer to that five o'clock threshold. Jar, any good questions out there? Uh, no, this has been a, a very good conversation. I'm scrolling through. If anything else, I think uh, is a as a must as we as we wrap up. Um, we haven't really talked on geopolitics, Professor. Uh, and obviously, you're focused more on the macro, but there's a number of things from the impact of of Russia Ukraine on commodities and 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 obviously there's the the Asian dynamics. Any has you how do you think about that risk generally as you think but about part of, part of the commodity rebound actually has been on the agricultural side and some of that is related to Ukraine. So it's not just uh, the fact that uh, you know there's a, there's a lot of demand there. So some of that is potential supply disruption there. One should mention it. I mean obviously there could be a sudden flare up, you know, could there be tactical nuclear, um, you know, could there be a surprise attack by China onto Taiwan? Um, although I think given the situation in China today, um, uh, you know, I, and unless, uh, you know, uh, Chairman Xi wants to divert the attention from slow economic growth <laughs> to a more nationalistic, Let's get Taiwan stance. Uh, he has other concerns right now um, uh, on his plate. Uh, you know, there's always geopolitical risks. Um, there's always oil, Iran risks, Middle East, which is always bubbling. Um, we've lived with those for 
the last uh, 60 years, and I, I think we'll live with those uh, forever to come. Well, Professor, I, we appreciate you always giving us the latest takes on the economy, the Fed, and uh, getting your latest latest takes on, on Behind the Markets every week, and we'll keep in touch. If people aren't listening to that show, we have a podcast to get the professor's comments again on our on our that strategies page on the markets link. You can find the professor's comments on all of our dashboards there as well. Jeremy, yep. do you want to mention tomorrow's show? With we, we have tomorrow on Behind the Market, we have Torsten Slock, who's the chief economist from Apollo. The professor will be with us for the hour talking to Torsten. We get his daily comments and, and Torsten's been, uh, has a lot of interesting comments on the economy and, and what's happening in, in the credit markets. It'll be an interesting uh, conversation with Torsten. Absolutely, thanks. Thanks, Professor. Thank you, thanks, Chair. everybody, for in. Oh, thank you, Jeremy, um, Kevin, and Professor Siegel. And I just want to announce that we have two office hours next week. Um, first is the second half outlook for Poly Macro, that's on Monday, July 31st at 1 p.m. And that's with Jeremy Schwartz and Sam Rines from Corbu as they discuss um, the future of inflation, the role of the Fed, geopolitical influences on regional allocations, and expert strategies for navigating the bond market. And then followed by Thursday, August 3rd at 12 p.m., we have Decoding Digital Assets, an engaging discussion with forward looking financial advisors. And that's with Matt Kress, our Director of Digital Assets and Advisor Innovation, Eric Urban from OnRamp, and then a few of your local peers um, to discuss the digital assets market. For geopolitics questions, I, the Corbu firm has a lot of interesting insights on geopolitics. I think that's a good, good conversation for Monday. Anybody wants to tune in on geopolitics. Thanks, Kat, for highlighting that and uh, everybody for, uh, for joining us. Have a great week. Have a great weekend. Take care. Thank you.